Last year, Vodafone marked the 30th anniversary of the first phone call on a Vodafone network. Um, back then, a mobile phone weighed 5 kilos, was 25 centimeters tall, um, only for the privilege really to, uh, you know, not, not really affordable. Um, since then, we have seen waves of technological innovation which have fundamentally changed the way we live and work and communicate. Today, um, Vodafone, for example, is working on 5G networks which will allow for data transit of one gigabit per second, radically new forms of hum human machine interaction. Um, what is your vision for that future in a gigabit society? Well, I think it's an amazing future and it's extraordinary, how, as you say, how fast we've come in a very short time. I remember getting one of those early mobile phones in my uh, former life as a diplomat. And they were the least mobile things ever invented. They weighed uh, a hell of a lot and you had to carry them around uh, and hold them like this in order to be able to speak. And now um, the computing power that you're carrying in your pocket uh, is greater than, than existed in, in some of the early space rockets. So, you know, we've, we've moved an extraordinary cycle already. I think the big thing that's changing now is the ability to be interconnected rather than just connected. Um, up to now, telecommunications and the technologies that have gone with it have created the ability for you to connect, to communicate, uh, to research and so forth. Um, increasingly now, as we see machines becoming connected uh, and, and humans connected through the devices they're carrying, those connections will themselves be carrying on and, and working between themselves and that interconnectedness, the application of an intelligence that sits um, between all of the various things that we accumulate and know and so forth, creates incredible potential to study some of the most difficult problems that humanity faces, how to solve some of the, the most difficult diseases we have, hunger, um, these kinds of things, uh, but also extraordinary opportunities to innovate and create new ways of doing business, new ways of creating wealth, new ways of serving customers and so forth. So I think it's a remarkable moment uh, and one that is very exciting. Are you afraid that artificial intelligence might take over? No, I'm not. Um, partly because I think we've already, uh, in, the, in various countries, skirted points at which the human capacity for intervention threatens aspects of society. And generally, we have built pretty rapidly uh, social codes around how you will create that kind of innovation and how you will deal with it. And I'm sure the same will be true of artificial intelligence and robotics as well. Mm -hmm. But secondly, I think that the opportunity for us to remove from the human condition today a lot of the more dangerous work that we do, a lot of the things that cause injury uh, and, and and sometimes called death, very sadly, to have those done by robots more safely to reduce risk in life. I think that's a huge mm. opportunity. I do think it'll be terribly important that we carry on taking exercise. I think, mm. you know, the big threat for us might be if robots are doing anything and we do nothing, mm. uh, and actually doing nothing is not very healthy. So I think we'll, we will need to find ways to reinvent activity, but safer and probably more enjoyable activity than some of that in the past. Mm. In order for all these innovations to materialize, we do, of course, need networks, we need infrastructure. And in order for this infrastructure to be built, we need the right political regulatory framework. What would be your key claims for that regulatory uh, framework? How yeah, should it so look like? I, I, well, uh, so I think there are, I think there are some, some big sort of framework type issues and there are some more detailed uh, and, and probably more immediate issues which are to do with how you get the investment to happen. It's clearly going to be very largely an investment by private investors, not public investors. Um, and so dealing with that one first, I think the two key things for me uh, you must have a framework which incentivizes investment. And in order to incentivize investment, you must have competition. And so long as you're looking as a, a regulator or as a policymaker at the balance between those two, how do I create an incentive to invest? And how do I reinforce that incentive to invest through competition so that it's not just one investor, but it's several investors who are looking at how they can create this new society? That will then drive innovation. It will drive customer service. Uh, you follow the customer where they want to take you. Um, and in that way, you, you build this dynamic, which will mean that we get the networks built as, as fast as they can be done. I think the other thing is to be clear about 
exactly what it is you want the outcome to be. Yeah. There's a debate going on at the moment about technology neutrality. Should we decide that this is the winning technology and so forth? I don't think it, the, an, the answer lies so much there. I think the answer lies more in, in saying, are we content, uh, for example, with a, a railway that goes at 50 kilometres an hour, or do we want railways that can do 500 kilometres an hour? Are we content with a network which is much faster than what we've got today, but is not? super fast, extraordinarily fast, giga fast? Um, or do we actually want, given that we've got the technology today, to move straight to the future-proof, highly advanced networks? Do we want to set our bar within which people can compete, innovate, mm -hmm. invest in the way that they want to, to invest, mm -hmm. at that high level? Um, and I'm very struck that every time computing and computer science has sort of defined limits of what's necessary, those limits, when you look back at them five, ten years later, look ridiculously small. Uh, and I think there is a risk for us today that we set our ambition mm. just not high enough. Uh, and I do worry that, that European policymakers mm. are doing that. For the longer term, I think preserving that cycle of investment, competition and innovation uh, is the thing that will drive um, a, a digital system which is really mm. responsive to what people want. Mm. Um, I do have a concern that I don't see many policymakers thinking about the implications of all of this for the world of work, uh, for what kind of work will exist in the future, what kind of employment will exist in the future, how people will get the satisfaction and the contribution uh, that we get in our daily lives today in a digital future. And I don't think the digital future is very far away. So I would urge policymakers to focus in the immediate term on creating the right system which will cause the investment but for the longer term also mm. to look at how we adapt ourselves uh, to this new digital world. Mm. Matthew, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very Thanks. much indeed.